folksy folks, welcome to Fabric of Folklore podcast. I'm your hostess, Vanessa Y. Rogers, and this is a podcast where we unravel the mysteries of folklore. We love stories in this podcast. We love legends, mythologies, fairy tales, but what sets us apart from other folklore podcasts is we want to know the story, the history behind these stories. We want to know the history behind the festivals, the traditions, the idioms. So for example, the other day I was talking with some mom friends about the word towhead, and one of the moms didn't actually even know what the word meant, and the other mom suggested maybe towhead referred to that because it's always referring to light-headed, blonde-headed children that maybe look like a, a toe, their head looked like a toe, but upon further uh, investigation, it turns out that the toe in towhead actually is spelled T-O-W, like tow truck, and refers to the flaxen, the flax, let's see, it refers to the fiber of flax, hemp, or jute prepared for spinning. And since flax is light in color, blonde people, especially children, are sometimes referred to as toeheads or toe-headed. So if you are a curious person like I am, this is the show for you. So make sure that you're subscribing today because you learn all sorts of fun facts about idioms and where your festivals come from and where your foodways for your traditions and your celebrations come from. Every Tuesday, our podcast drops a new episode about these topics, so make sure you're subscribing. And if you are a longtime listener, if you could rate or review our show, that is so helpful for a new podcast like ours. Um, our guest today is the author of the book, Trick or Treat, The History of Halloween. The book is the first to look at the both the history of festival and its growth around the world in 21st century, and it fills a gap in the understanding of Halloween then, now, and potentially its future four ways. Uh, Lisa Morton is a screenwriter, author of both nonfiction books as well as four novels. She's a six-time winner of the Brom Stoker, Brom Stoker, Stoker Award and is also a world-class Halloween and paranormal expert. So thank you so much for joining us on Fabric of Folklore. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Vanessa. We're going to have fun. Yes, absolutely. I mean, what is not fun about Halloween? I just, I, this is my favorite ho holiday. Obviously mine. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your journey into writing this book, Trick or Treat. Um, I, my first Halloween book actually was back about 20 years ago and it was called the Halloween encyclopedia. Um, mm. and I kind of fell into it by accident. I had done a film book for a publisher and after we finished that book, the publisher said, Hey, would you like to do another book with us? And so I looked at things that they had just brought out and they had just released something called the Christmas encyclopedia. So I, wrote them back and said, Hey, you know, you did this book. What do you think about a Halloween encyclopedia? Because no one's ever done that. And, uh, they said, great. And for some weird reason, I thought that was going to be easy to write. You know, it's like, <laughs> no Dumbo, it's an encyclopedia. It took years, of course. And the good part about that, though, the, was that by the time I was done, I had amassed so much information, it was really easy to roll it over into other books. Um, mm. So then in 20, I think it was 2012, I brought out Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween. And um, it was interesting that in your introduction there, you mentioned the global stuff. That mm -hmm. had changed completely between the time that I did the first edition of the encyclopedia and 2012 when I did Trick or Treat. Just in that span of 10 years, Halloween exploded around the world. Interesting. And what, what year did you say that was? I think the encyclopedia, I've done two editions of it. I think the first edition was 20, was 2001 or 2002. Mm -hmm. And then the um, Trick or Treat was 2012. Okay, yeah, and that was when it really started to to blossom around in different countries. I was absolutely just gobsmacked when I was doing the research for Trick or Treat and just saw, oh, wait, suddenly people are celebrating it in China and Russia mm -hmm. and throughout mm -hmm. Europe. That was not the case just 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I... You know, I worked in South Korea in um, 2012 teaching English, and I remember... Um, 
we we I, it was at a camp and all of the teachers we were from all over the world so it wasn't just americans it was english irish south africans it was english speakers but um we dressed up for that day because it was halloween and um a lot of the the koreans were like what is this and so i remember like realizing that it was not actually something that was celebrated quite as strongly outside of um, America. I knew that it was celebrated in other English speaking countries, but it was it was kind of eye opening because I didn't even realize it wasn't a global phenomenon um, until I, I was out of the country. Yeah, yeah. It caught on first in, of course, Japan has been celebrating mm -hmm. it for a long time because of their love of costuming. And yeah. um, it <laughs> caught on fairly early on in Hong Kong, where they had, of course, mm. a lot of an English speaking population. But mm -hmm. now you see it spreading throughout the rest of Asia, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to talk a little bit about some of how they're uh, doing different traditions off of our traditions, because I'm sure they're, you know, making their own traditions on their own. Oh, yes. Um, when did your love of Halloween begin? Well, I always loved it as a kid. Um, I call myself one of those weird little girls who wanted to be a monster and not a Disney princess. Um, <laughs> I, I think I was always a little bit of the outsider. So I always loved that aspect of it where, you know, you got to dress up as something you loved and go out for mm -hmm. one night a year and people would, re would uh, reward you with candy. I mean, you know, how can you not love that? Um, right. And so I always loved it, but um, like I said, I almost fell into the book writing of it by accident, but you cannot mm. write something called an encyclopedia and not become obsessed with the subject. So I have been officially <laughs> obsessed with it for about 20 years now. And why do you think Halloween uh, is so popular in particular in the U.S. and then we can talk about outside of the U.S.? I, I think there's something about it that is magical in terms of its placement in the year. Um, it comes at that time when the days are getting shorter here. We are having the harvest, a lot of um, things that we associate with it, like corn stalks and scarecrows and so forth are related to harvest things. But mm -hmm. I think on an even deeper level, um, it gives us a sort of playful, safe space to test our fears. And mm -hmm. um, I think that's a large part of the reason that we love um, scary movies at Halloween, that we love haunted attractions, that we love dressing up as monsters or creatures. Um, it just gives us that chance to kind of test our own bounds and maybe even grow a little bit in terms of, oh, you know what? I survived that. I can do this. <laughs> yeah, it, it gives us that thrill that you, you don't get in other holidays. The, the scare factor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think is the cultural significance of, of, of Halloween here in the U.S.? Um, again, I think it comes back to that, giving us that, that safe space to test ourselves. It also has, of course, acquired some other interesting meanings, too. Um, it allows people to maybe explore their sexuality, um, mm -hmm. It's interesting that one of the groups that co-opted it during the 70s, up until the 70s, it had been mainly a holiday celebrated by kids. And then you get a couple of these mm -hmm. interesting counterculture movements in the 70s that start going, hey, we love this holiday. And one of those was LGBTQ plus people, uh -huh. um, you know, and then, of course, in the last 20 years or so, maybe 30 years, we saw that rise of sexy costumes for Halloween. Yes. Um, yeah. And I know there's been a lot of debate over that, that um, for some women, it gives them a chance to explore that side of themselves when they can't in their day to day life. And of course, there's also the side that says, I don't know, it's kind of sexist and objectifying women. But um, <laughs> I, I'm somewhere in the middle. I, you know, if you enjoy dressing up that way and it makes you feel great that one night a year, I'm all for it. And what about, so um, we'll talk a little bit about where it came from, but it originated in Ireland. Is that right? It did with the Irish Celts. Um, mm -hmm. And that is probably around 2000 years ago. Which is amazing that this holiday has been celebrated for 2000 years. Obviously, it's gone through lots of evolutions, but it's it's crazy to think about that this is a 
a tradition that has been going on for so long, right? It is. And um, it, when we talk about the Celts, we should specify that there are two things about them. One is that they were a conglomeration of tribes and they were all over um, the British Isles and Europe. And we don't know a lot about them because they didn't write down their own history. And what we know about them comes from either archaeological evidence or what the early missionaries were writing down because the missionaries were coming in around the 6th, 7th century to Ireland trying to convert mm -hmm. these people. And mm -hmm. they uh, wrote down a lot of the lore and so forth that they were learning at the time. And so it's possible that Celtic tribes all over Europe celebrated Samhain, which was their name for Halloween. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't know. Um, and we don't know exactly everything that they did on Samhain. We know that it was a three-day celebration for them. We know that it was a time when they thought the veil between worlds was at its thinnest because it was their New Year's celebration. So it was this kind of borderline liminal time. And they told ghost stories. Um, we have mm -hmm. many of those that were transcribed and they are still very scary, some of them. <laughs> and I think there is no question that that is where Halloween gets that kind of spooky and macabre side. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel like is the, is the cultural significance deeper in Ireland, for instance? Um, it's different. Um, I think that Americans really glommed on to this holiday and made it their own. And that began in the mid 19th century. So it's mm -hmm. been for about 150 years now, it's really been an American holiday. Um, it was It has been celebrated, I think, much more here even than in Ireland. And um, mm. In the in the Great Britain, it was not celebrated at all for many, many decades because mm -hmm. uh, back in the 17th century, uh, Britain broke away from the church and decided to ban a lot of the church holidays. And at that point, All Saints Day was one of those holidays they banned. So oh, wow. people in Scotland and Ireland were still celebrating Halloween, but not the rest of the British Isles. Wow. That's so tragic. Why did they try and be in holidays? <laughs> uh, I agree, but it was all part of trying to break away from the church and establish their own Church of England. Uh huh. Yeah. Start start anew. Start fresh. Um. You say that this is one of the most misunderstood holidays. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there are a lot of things that, I mean, I hear all the time that are just not quite true. Um, and it's interesting <laughs> to me that it's also a holiday that I suspect very few people who celebrate it know what the name means. Um, <laughs> you know, you obviously know what New Year's Eve means. We even know what Valentine's Day refers to. We know there was a uh -huh. saint called Valentine. I'm guessing a lot of people don't have any idea what Halloween means. It is an abbreviation for Hollow's Evening. Um, hollow was an old word for saints. So the eve was when they would start celebrating um, a holiday. And All Saints Day is actually November 1st. So they would start celebrating All Saints Day when the sun went down on October 31st. And that became the eve wow. of All Hollow's Day. So um, that's like the first thing I think people don't quite know. But um, mm -hmm. you hear things all the time like, oh, trick or treat goes back to the Druids. <laughs> um, there is absolutely zero evidence for that, unfortunately, as romantic as it sounds. Um, the truth is, as I mentioned earlier, we don't know a lot about what they did on Halloween, but there is no recorded evidence whatsoever to support the idea that the Celts dressed in any kind of costume, that they did any kind of begging for food. Um, and in fact, Trick or Treat is very recent. It's less than 100 years old. And it mm. was invented by the Americans. Um, <laughs> it obviously, again, people will say, oh, but it, it stems from a practice called souling, which was something that was done in the British Isles and goes back centuries. But again, no direct line from souling, which was a, a practice where kids would go house to house and beg treats on November 2nd, which is All Souls Day. Um, mm -hmm. Trick or treat came about as a way to buy off kids who were playing really destructive pranks. 
uh, in the first part of the 20th century, Halloween was celebrated mainly by these teenage boys. And, and this, again, it was something they had gotten from the Irish. The Irish loved to play jokes on Halloween. And American boys loved that, too. And, and up until the about 1920s, the jokes were pretty innocent. The kids would go out and, you know, tip mm-hmm. over an outhouse or rattle a window or something like that. But then America becomes more urbanized and these kids move into the cities and they start breaking light fixtures and setting fires. And they are costing cities millions of dollars in damages. And the cities, many of them, um, this is also during the Great Depression when no one's got money. Mm -hmm. The cities, many of them start to think about banning Halloween. But fortunately, Mm -hmm. a few of them think, oh, you know what? Maybe a better idea is to just buy these kids off with parties. (laughs) <laughs> so the city starts sending homeowners these little guides, these little party pamphlets, and they would say, hey, give the kids something that they called a house to house party. And this was where a bunch of houses would get together so that one house didn't have to bear all the cost. And each house would give the kids something different. So the first house would give the kids a little costume and the next house would give the kids a candy and the next house would give the kids a little scare in the basement. And um, this worked and the kids stopped playing all of the destructive pranks. And by 1939, we get the phrase trick or treat recorded with all of this. And that's really the real start of trick or treating. So those people who say that the candy company started started the the tradition of treat or, trick or treat that's there's no actual evidence to support that. No, in fact, it's it's very plain the other way around. Um, we have there's a National Magazine article in 1939, which is the first time we really see trick or treat mentioned, and it is very specific about buying these kids off. And in that article, she talks about, hey, make them popcorn balls and make them some cider and make them some donuts. It isn't until after World War II that you get these candy companies coming in and going, hey, mom, you don't have to spend all day making these popcorn balls anymore. We're going to give you the stuff that the kids really love anyways, which is chocolate. Um, so the moms love it. The kids love it. And you can sort of even see that progression in magazine ads. You can see that there's nothing Mm. before World War II. And then after that, you start to see the full page ads for the candy companies coming in. (laughs) And then they're like, oh, wait, why, why weren't we investing in this in the first place? (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Um, in your book, you talk about Charles Vant. Valency, uh-huh. the British military engineer. Can you tell us about the book that he wrote that was completely false? Yeah, this is uh, where we get this mistaken notion that Halloween is some, somehow connected to the worship of a lord of death and is based on an <laughs> evil thing. Um, Valency was an 18th century surveyor who was sent by um, Her Majesty over in Britain to survey Ireland. And he was there for many years and he became obsessed with Celtic culture and he collected hundreds of thousands of words of lore. And he ended up printing a six volume set, which has an unpronounceable Latin title, so I'm not going to mangle it. But um, he unfortunately was an absolute fool who was completely denounced by every single historian of the day. He was uh, obsessed with disproving things that everyone knew were true. And one of the things everyone knew was true was that Samhain, which was the name of the Celtic celebration, stood for summer's end. Well, he decided very arbitrarily, no, that's that's not it. I'll find a more interesting origin for that name. And he <laughs> did a very convoluted, I mean, you try to read this in his book and you're like, what? This convoluted chain of logic leading him to conclude that the name derived from the worship of an Indian deity. And see, he ends up out of this concluding somehow that the Celts worship a lord of death on, on Samhain. And it's completely made up. It's just completely arbitrary. It makes no sense. But his books found their way into libraries and books, mm-hmm. bookstores and collectors all over the world. And that formed what I call the weird alternate history of Halloween, which is that it is somehow based in the evil worship of a Lord of death. Which is where a lot of re- religious organizations take uh, 
they they don't like Halloween because of this book in particular? Yes, exactly. And you can, again, you can chart an interesting line throughout history. In the mid-20th century, for example, um, the only Halloween history book that was released for about 50 years was something that came out in the 1950s called Halloween Through 20 Centuries. And you can see that they drew a lot from Valency. And mm. um, that book is actually ends up with this insane conclusion about they call Halloween something like the most depraved or degraded or something like that uh, of holidays. And again, all based on a mistake. <laughs> crazy that is you know it's so interesting you know a lot of our history comes from whatever people write but you know they we never we never know if it's actually truth or not and then people just take it for truth I mean sometimes it's, it can be fact-checked but you know it's always the people who write the books that ends up being the the truth tellers but not necessarily the actual truth yeah, yeah. And it's always unfortunate when people use that because another 15 minutes of research, if you dig into where that comes from and you start to find out, wait a minute, this guy just made everything up. And, and... <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so one of the things that you said in your book was four facts we know for sure. One, it has origins in both pagan and Christian roots. Two, its position in the autumn calendar, the harvest celebration three festivals of dead around the world and four parties and mischief making. Can you talk a little bit about those four facts? Sure. Um, I think we already mentioned the harvest element of it coming at mm -hmm. the time of year that it does. And the um, celebration around the year, the, the mischief making is a fun history too. A lot of that comes from the fact that um, one of the Irish's or Irish people's favorite mythology folklore tales is about Jack the trickster and Jack mm. was a famous trickster and there are stories about Jack told in many many cultures he is um, around Europe and the British Isles and America and so forth in many variants but in all of them he is a guy often a blacksmith who is very cunning and sly and he um, manages to trick the devil three times uh, into not taking his soul. And Jack lives a, a really wild life. He's a gambler and a drunk and so forth. So the devil would love to have Jack's soul, but Jack tri <laughs> tricks him three times and ends up living to a ripe old age. But finally Jack dies. And when he dies, um, obviously heaven's not going to let this guy in and he goes to hell and uh the devil meets him at the doorway to hell and says i'm so mad at you you're not coming in here either but i will at least give you this glowing hell ember so you can have some light and jack takes this ember and puts it in a carved out gourd and he uses that to light his way as his spirit eternally roams this sort of shadow realm and um, that story was something almost everybody knew in like the 17th, 18th century. So mm -hmm. Irish pranksters would take, and they didn't have pumpkins, they had big mm -hmm. turnips. They would take one of these big turnips and they would carve it out to look like Jack's gourd. And they would set that out somewhere on Halloween night and put a candle inside, of course. And you can imagine if you're a traveler and you're out on that night and you're turning the the corner on some very dark place and you come on that, it would have given you a bit of a fright. Yeah. Um, and so that's why that particular object is called the Jack-O-Lantern. It is Jack of the Lantern. And oh, interesting. yeah, that's where that whole tradition comes from. Now, one of the other interesting things about that is that when the Irish came to America, which was mainly in the 1840s, they were fleeing famine. Um, they brought that tradition with them, but it took a while for that to kind of catch on here. And people were carving. I mean, as soon as the Irish saw these big, gorgeous pumpkins in the new world, they loved those. They were carving those, of course. It took a while for that to become popular with Americans and associated specifically with Halloween. Mm -hmm. um, you can find some sort of mid 19th century illustrations of kids carving them, but they're just doing it during the fall. It's not a holiday specific mm -hmm. thing. It's not until about 1900 that we see that firmly associated with Halloween. And then of course, within a, within a few years, that pumpkin becomes the kind of king of Halloween icons. 
Yeah. And in the you said that the um, origins of Halloween are both pagan and Christian roots. Can you talk about how there's kind of that combination? Yeah. Um, the Celts, of course, were celebrating Samhain when the Christian missionaries come into Ireland. And at the time, the Catholic Church had a really smart doctrine of not trying to stamp out these existing celebrations and temples and believers, but of trying to co-opt them. So they mm. would often uh, take an existing celebration that was very popular and assign it to um, uh, assign a new meaning to it. And All Saints Day originally had been celebrated on May 13th and had commemorated the um, uh, building of this massive saints rotunda in in Rome, and um, when they moved up into Ireland and were trying to uh, Christianize these Celts, they moved the celebration of All Saints Day and they moved it to October through uh, to November first. And mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that apparently it was not immediately successful because about mm -hmm. four hundred years later, we're now in the eleventh century. You get people saying, um, oh, we want a day. Yeah, it's nice that we have All Saints Day to celebrate the saints. We want a day to celebrate our own loved ones. So at that mm. point, the Catholic Church adds All Souls Day to um, the celebration by putting that on November 2nd. So All Souls Day is interesting because unlike All Saints Day, it definitely has a macabre side. Um, it was about praying for your loved ones who might be trapped in purgator purgatory and mm -hmm. unable to move on. And um, there were some beliefs surrounding witches and so forth on that day. So that kind of uh, comes in and combines better with a lot of mm -hmm. the sow and ghost stories and belief in mischievous, uh, malicious fairies. And um, at that point, the, the Celts are pretty much converted. Mm -hmm. And where do we see these holidays, All Saints Days and All Soul Days celebrated today? Are, are, are there strongholds still around the world that celebrate those, those particular uh, celebrations? There are, and, and it is um, any country that is still heavily Catholic will celebrate those. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not quite the important holiday in the Catholic ca calendar that it once was. In the 1950s, they actually kind of downgraded All Saints Day um, and removed a lot of the special things that had once been associated with it. But it is still a major mass, for example, in the ca mm -hmm. uh, Catholic calendar. So you'll find places, it's really interesting, there are places in the world where they will be celebrating Halloween on the evening of October 31st, and then the next day they're doing the more sober All Saints Day, which is usually like going to the graveyard and cleaning off the grave or the tombstone of someone you love who has passed on. Um, or it might be setting out food uh, for their spirits at home who uh, that one day they're going to return home and you want to have their favorite things out for them. Mm hmm so we're talking about like tr the celebrations of Day of the Dead that that we see in in Mexico and Latin America. Uh, are those those are connected? Is that is that right? They are, and Dia de los Muertos in Mexico is is what you get if you remove the Celtic influence from Halloween, mm -hmm. and you have those same missionaries now coming in to convert indigenous peoples in Mexico, the Mayans, the Aztecs, and they took existing celebrations of the dead that those people had. And um, they combine them with All Saints Day, and you end up getting a very different celebration from Halloween, although you can see certain things in common. Um, and then there are, of course, other existing celebrations of the dead around the world. In Asia, there's the Hungry Ghost Festival, which is usually celebrated sometime in July. And mm -hmm. um, that's, again, a very similar kind of thing where you're putting out um, your loved one's favorite foods and things that they loved in the belief that they are mm -hmm. coming home during that time. Well, and this answers one of my questions because we had a guest on a few uh, shows ago who talked about Lithuania and how it was one of the last pagan uh, holdouts in all of Europe. And it was one of the, the last ones to be converted into Catholicism. And they celebrate their own version of Day of the Dead. But it's very different than what you see in Latin America, for instance. Latin America is very wild and, and loud and colorful and, and vibrant, whereas theirs is very somber and um, 
and and uh, reflective rather than parades and um, you know loudness. <laughs> but I was I was very confused as to how why they were two separate celebrations all happening at the same time, but they were they were similar in some ways, but also very different. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that kind of wild aspect to Dia de los Muertos is fairly contemporary um, because it really has been much more of a sober, somber kind of thing, um, very similar to what you see in in European countries with Mm. um, a traditional Dia de los Muertos will be celebrated by making what is called an ofrenda in your house. And that's Mm -hmm. like an altar to remember your loved ones. And it will involve going at it. Uh, maybe even at night to clean their graves. And and it's all Mm. about, it's kind of, you know, a little bit melancholy, but also joyful because you believe that they're coming home. And um, so I think you find that in many of those sort of celebrations of your dead loved ones. So when you were talking about how it was their new year and how, you know, it was kind of their harvest celebration, that made me a initially think of Thanksgiving. Um, How did it it turn out that we had a separate harvest celebration with Thanksgiving? Do you you have any idea what what happened with that? I know with Thanksgiving, there was, it's of course, completely American. um, Mm -hmm. Although most cultures have some celebration of bringing the harvest in. And um, I know there was like one woman who really lobbied throughout, I think, the late 19th, early 20th century to get it recognized in, as an official U.S. holiday. It's pretty recent. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. even though we go back to the pilgrims in our mythology about Thanksgiving and so forth, it's um, the official celebration of it is, I think, about 120 years old, something like that. But one of the interesting things about Thanksgiving is if you look at the history of it in the U.S., you can see like 140 years ago, you'll see some similar things that look like Halloween. Um, There actually was Mm. a pageant in New York City of kids in costume that was a Thanksgiving tradition before trick or treat came along. And um, again, it was during a time when people just loved to dress in, up in costumes. So I don't think you can find a direct link between that Thanksgiving uh, event and trick or treat. But it's just one of those odd, oh, that's interesting that kids were once dressing up in costume on Thanksgiving as well. Uh huh. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, so one of the things that we uh Let's see. Lack of understanding of history. I was trying to think back about what I knew about where it originated. And we talked about this already, I think. Um, Why do you think it is that people don't know a lot about the history of of Halloween? That's a really good question. And and I am not sure. (laughs) Um, I, you know, I, I suspect the obvious answer is that people may not know a lot about the history of any holiday. Um, Mm -hmm. I think they know the surface facts on things, but, um, I mean, how many people know, for example, that our popular image of Santa Claus, I think mainly came from Coca-Cola's marketing. Um, Mm -hmm. so I think we just, holidays are kind of a subject that not a lot of people really consider. Mm -hmm. Which I think is such a shame because I, I feel like when you understand the history of where your traditions are coming from, it just gives it much more depth. And, uh, you know, a connection with your, your past. Yeah. So I really, I particularly, obviously, that's why I do this podcast. I love understanding where our traditions come from. And I've been learning so much. I'm sure you do too, through all, all of your, uh, <laughs> your research. And still learning. I, I actually keep like files on my desk of new things I find out about Halloween. <laughs> Do you have something that you just found out that surprised you? A little bit. I just found, um, I stumbled across a very old book on Catholic observances, and it talked very specifically about the history of 
um, the Catholic Church removing what they used to call an uh, what they called an octave, and this was something that used to surround Halloween, and it was like an eight day observation in the churches. And um, I knew a little about the removal of that in the mid fifties, but it was interesting to read it from the point of view of a religious scholar. And um, mm-hmm. this was a book that I think was written not long after the church did that. Interesting. So. In your book, you talk a little bit about Guy Fawkes and how in his connection with Halloween. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Guy Fawkes was a uh, guy who tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament in the early 17th century. He was part of a conspiracy. There were something like 15 of them um, who were very upset with Parliament and the king at the time. And so um, Guy was the one who got tasked with hiding in the basement with the 36 uh, barrels of gunpowder. <laughs> um, he was going to to light that up and blow everybody to kingdom come. And sadly for Guy, he was caught, as were many of the mm. other conspirators, and he was hung, um, or hanged rather. And um, so he was um, hanged. I think it was either caught or hanged. I forget which. On November fifth, which is now the celebration of Guy Fox Day. So. November 5th is still celebrated in Great Britain. It is um, one of the reasons that the British love it was that it was close to Halloween. And so they could have a fall celebration after Halloween was removed from their own calendars. Mm. And so Guy Fawkes took on a lot of the celebrations that used to surround Halloween. They, They built bonfires and kids would go house to house um, begging material for the bonfires and they would paint themselves up in suit and they would burn effigies of Guy Fox. So it had a lot of the sort of autumnal, fiery costume celebrating. It also had some uh, very specific foods, which again is something you find associated with Halloween history. And it had, for example, a um, very specific toffee pudding that was made just for, Mm. um, I think still is for Guy Fawkes Day. One thing that did change though was um, in about the mid 19th century, you get the bonfires are, they have to stop because they have pretty much scraped the hillsides (laughs) barren of wood. And so, yeah, you kind of get the bonfires going away in the mid 19th century, but you can still find humongous um, Guy Fox celebrations in parts of Britain today. And, and they look very much like our New Orleans Mardi Gras. Uh, <laughs> the same kind of thing with big crews of people. And each crew has its own theme and they all dress up and they parade through the town and they end up, they do indeed burn an effigy of Guy Fox and sometimes of the Pope, which is why in certain areas, the holiday was also called Pope Night. So, do they still in England, do they celebrate Halloween now? Is it is it widespread there? It is. Um, that's, again, part of that sort of globalization of it. And it caught on more there earlier, um, mm-hmm. but it is uh, much more popular now. And I mean, they're even now growing pumpkins, you know, in parts of Europe and, and oh, the British really? Isles. So they uh, pumpkins are huge throughout um, Britain and, and Europe now. So do they like kind of pair those two celebrations together since they're so close to one another or are they completely separate? They still are pretty much separate. Um, They are, even though they're very similar, but I, for example, I have British friends who celebrate Halloween with fireworks, um, which is Mm -hmm. something that they may do again five days later for Guy Fawkes Day. (laughs) Yeah. Why not? (laughs) The more, the more fireworks, the better, right? Right. (laughs) Um, can you, uh, tell us what are some of the biggest misunderstandings of Halloween? Well, that, that idea that trick or treat goes back centuries is always a big one. And, um, I also, of course, hear, oh, um, we dress up in masks on Halloween to scare away evil spirits and that, no, I'm Mm -hmm. sorry, that's not right. Um, we dress Mm -hmm. up in masks because it was a way of buying off really naughty kids, Um, (laughs) so as charming as it is to think that you are participating in an ancient tradition involving scaring off evil spirits, no, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> and uh, of course, we mentioned that sort of misunderstanding surrounding um, what a lot of fundamentalists, unfortunately, have come to believe that the holiday celebrates a pagan lord of death. Um, we know mm. that's that is a complete historical misunderstanding. And um, the name is one that you see a lot of people have no idea what the name means. And and I've seen one or two odd conjectures on that that were like, okay, no. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it is, I think trick or treat is probably the one I get the most questions about. Okay. Um, so let's go, let's do a history lesson. Give us how far back does Halloween go and what do we know from what records we have? We, I think the first writings we get from the Catholic missionaries were around the 7th and 8th century AD um, and many more from around the 10th and 11th centuries. And they were transcribing mainly Celtic fairy tales, Celtic lore um, that was being passed orally. The Celts did pass their history orally. They didn't write anything down which of course is a tremendous <laughs> pity now, but, um, yeah. and so from the stuff that was written down, we do mention that they celebrated a three day, um, observance for Samhain that they told mm -hmm. very scary stories. It was also a boring administrative time for them because it was the end of the year. It was a time when they would collect taxes and pay off their debts. And there was one, um, interesting rite that they would do where every hearth, every fire on every hearth in Ireland was extinguished. And there were these people who would um, go around and pass the people new fire that came from the lords or the king's hearth. Mm. And they would use that to relight their fires for the coming year. Um, and uh, then you get... Um, probably having um, certain foods and so forth. As you move into the kind of 12th, 13th, 14th centuries, and you start to see it combining more with All Saints Day, um, we start to th see the things like bobbing for apples. We see very mm -hmm. early mentions of that. Um, parties. There is a delightful mention from the 17th century of a young um, upper crust Englishman going to a costume Ball on Halloween night. It sounds really fun. And mm. by the time you get into like the 18th century, we get it now being celebrated in Ireland and in, in Scotland. And the best description we have from that period is by the poet Robert Burns, um, who most people will know something like My Love is Like a Red, Red Rose or Auld Lang Syne, that kind of thing. But he wrote a spectacular, very long, very detailed poem in 1785 on Halloween. And it is all about the people at a Halloween party and what they are doing. So from that poem, we know that they celebrated it with a party. They were playing fortune telling games. And it was mm. a time when young people were obsessed with finding out who they were going to marry. So most of the games are about finding out who you would marry. And they might be something like um, you would be blindfolded and there would be a series of bowls holding different things. And you would um, be spun around and then stagger forward. And whichever bowl you touched first would indicate your future. Um, if you touch the empty bowl, you were going to be a spinster. If you touch the one with a ring in it, you were, would be married, that kind of thing. Although mm -hmm. some of the games also got somewhat macabre. Some of them involved going outside to something like the barn um, and calling on the devil to show you who mm. you were going to end up marrying. And um, mm. uh, Burns has a lot of fun in the poem with talking about things like someone going out to um, the fields to, to try one of these and being scared to death by the pig running across him and thinking at first it's the devil, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, were there any, so were there any deities such, uh, associated with the Samhain celebrations, for the pagan celebrations with the Celts? Well, the Celts believed in a sort of mother and father um, deity. The Morgan was the mother, the father was the Dagda, and um, they thought these deities changed their aspect. They, um, at Samhain, they moved into the sort of 
uh, hag or crone version. The Morrigan became this crone. Um, mm. And then on the flip side of the calendar, which was called Beltane and was celebrated on um, the eve of April 30th, they thought the Morgan and the dog that would be reborn is the beautiful young couple. So those would be the cup the, those would be the deities most, I think at the center of um, the Samhain lore, but there was also a um, race that the uh, sort of heroes of the Celtic lore had replaced when they came to Ireland and they were these things called the Fomorians and they were very scary and evil and they would pop up in some of the Samhain tales and they would they would come out on that night and they would they would do terrible things and uh, later on in those Samhain tales we also get the she and the she were the malicious fairies who would cross over on Samhain night and do things like burn down the palace and uh, kidnap unwary humans and take them back to their own other world. And uh, when we hear that the Celts thought these scare these fairies were very frightening, we're not talking Tinkerbell, you know, we're talking <laughs> really badass, scary things. <laughs> So they had a lot of their tales around Samhain were were mischief making, and and serious mischief making, right? Not just like small pranks. Yeah, exactly. And and the mischief took some very weird forms. There is one famous um, tale about a warrior who the king sends out on Samhain night and and with this challenge. And the challenge is very weird. The challenge is that there was a criminal who was hanged that day and no one has been able to put a loop around the foot of this criminal. And so he challenges this warrior to do it and says, if you can do this, I'll give you my gold sword. And this, this warrior goes out and he manages to put the loop around the foot of this corpse. It, it's very difficult. It keeps sliding off. When he does, the corpse comes back to life and the corpse says, I I was hanged. I'm very thirsty. Can you cut me down and take me to get a drink? And so he takes the corpse to the nearest house to get him a drink. And the corpse walks in and there's a family in the house and he, they hand him a cup of water and he takes a sip of the water, spits it back in their faces and they all die. Um, so these things are still really weird and really frightening. <laughs> yeah. And is there any backstory about who he was or like why he he wanted to curse these people uh you, you know i think it was just a fairy tale that they told mm -hmm. every Samhain. um the heroes and so forth are usually were probably real people but mm -hmm. it's like um the greeks telling the stories about the legend of hercules and his 12 labors and so forth i mean there probably was a real strong man who was part of history but it's all been lost, of course, in time now as to how much of this is real. And mm -hmm. So tell us, you were telling us a bit about the evolution, but can you tell us, you know, when it changed and how it changed from its colonial roots, European traditions, and how the Irish brought it over to America and, you know, some of those, those consistent ev evolutions of this holiday? Yeah, it was... Um as I mentioned earlier with the Robert Burns poem, by the 18th century, you get it being celebrated only in Ireland and Scotland. The British aren't doing much with it at that time. And there's a terrible famine at that point. Um, all mm. of the crops have failed and so forth. So a lot of the Scottish and Irish peoples are coming to America to seek a new life. And they're, of course, bringing this tradition with them because they really loved Halloween. And, and there's an interesting thing that's happening at the time, which you wouldn't think about tying in with this, but it is new printing technologies. And the new printing technologies are making magazines very popular. We're talking like 1850, 1860, around there. And every housewife in America is now reading magazines. And there are tons of magazines, Godey's Ladies Book and Harper's Monthly and all kinds of things. And these magazines are so desperate for content that they're buying all kinds of like regional stories. And they are buying these quaint tales from people who um, knew a um, an Irish or Scottish family or whatever, and um, describing how they celebrated this holiday. And, and these 
these housewives start thinking that sounds really fun. And some of the stories begin talking about kids and parties for kids. And so they start giving all of the kids parties and the parties at this point um, were for kids. They would consist of things like um, pulling taffy, making candy, playing some of the same mm-hmm. fortune telling games. They would, and then in the evening they would tell ghost stories. There are some very cute stories about little girls hearing these ghost stories and getting freaked out and not being able to sleep. And um, so that's kind of how Halloween goes until about 1900. And that's when the the serious prank playing really starts to come in. You also at that time start to get a few adults participating in the holiday as well, starting to have their own parties apart from what's being offered to the kids. And then um, you do start to get some of the retailing coming in. Um, There's an interesting thing that happens in retailing from 1900 to 1920, which is postcards. And this is before telephones were in every household and people communicated quite often via a postcard because it was easy Mm -hmm. to jot down a short message, throw a stamp on it. And there were around 3000 Halloween postcards produced during this time. And they are, many of them are absolutely gorgeous and they give us a really good look at what was going on with Halloween at the time. And we, we get that total sense of fun and whimsy out of them. They, many of them feature pumpkins. Um, you can also see how the witch evolves by looking at these, um, these postcards because the witches on these postcards are usually dressed in red and they just look like old women dressed in red. And it isn't until 1939 that we really get that final image of the witch in place because of the Wizard of Oz. And when the Wizard of Oz comes out and there's Margaret Hamilton with the green skin and the black and the tall pointed hat. The hat was actually in place before that, but the witch is not dressed in black, not green skin. It took a movie to do that. (laughs) What do you think? What was the red significance of the color of the their outfit was there significance or was, was it just um just the colors that they had chosen yeah i i don't know that there was any real significance to it i suspect that it was probably just a color that was popular for cloaks i mean you, you can look at something like a little mm-hmm. red riding hood you know and um mm-hmm. somehow i'm not that's a really good question i actually am not sure why you see it uh, so often on the images of witches from that time my first thought was the red, the scarlet letter, you ah. know, how it was blazoned on our shirt. But um, I don't know if that is actually true or not. <laughs> That's just where my mind went. Um. I think you you may be onto something there, though, because I, I suspect the witches were often thought to be like the women who were outside of the rest of society. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Something to do with that. Did red signify the devil at that point? Um, it didn't. And in fact, if you look at early devil costumes from this time, they usually are talking about black rather than red. Interesting. So tell us about the evolution of the witch. So so we really fortified the, the costume from the Wizard of Oz. But before that, tell us a little bit about about that superstition and how it has to do with Halloween. The the idea of witches in Halloween is one of the weirder things because it is political in origin. Um, it's mm. 16th century King James, and this is the same King James whose name we see on our Bibles. Um, King mm-hmm. James was the mm-hmm. King of Scotland at the time, and he was uh, both obsessed with demonology and witches and was again, looking to separate himself from the church. And when there were a number of witch trials that were held, and I think it was something like 1585, um, in an area of Scotland called North Berwick, his inquisitors for the first time, this is the first time we ever see this in the coming up in these interrogations, this tie between witches and All Hallows' Eve, with the witch, witches saying, oh, we celebrated our main Sabbath on All Hallows' Eve. And um, mm-hmm. my suspicion is that the interrogators were directed to come up with that because it solidified uh, James's desire to get away from the church. 
by making one of their main holidays something that was evil and that was sacred to witches. So I think it was his way of killing two birds with one stone. And then after that, we see the witches are very commonly celebrated with Halloween. Um, if you look at certain other sources from around Europe, you'll actually see witches celebrated more with um, the other end of the calendar, Beltane or May Day. Um, and they were thought to all convene on this one mountain called um, Brocken on that night and would hold these wild revels and so forth. Interesting. So um, there are lots of other superstitious superstitions and creatures that have to do with Halloween, for instance, um, black cats. Can you tell us a little bit about the connection between black cats and Halloween and uh, spiders, for instance? Uh, black cats. Um, cats were usually thought to be familiars of witches. And, and it kind of, again, makes sense. If you look at the witch was actually an old, probably an elderly person living out on the edge of the village, um, they probably had a cat as a companion. The cat was helpful mm -hmm. to keep the vermin down in their, their houses and so forth. Um, this would also be where we get the association of brooms and cauldrons, again, thought to be, they're really just traditional household items that were, mm -hmm. came to be associated with witches. And the black cat in particular, though, uh, my theory on why it is the black cat celebrated with Halloween is that we get that from the Edgar Allan Poe story, The Black Cat, um, mm. which became a Halloween favorite, even though the story does not mention Halloween directly. It was told um, at billions of Halloween parties and was a mm. seasonal favorite. And I suspect that's where we get the, the, the idea of the specifically black cat being associated with mm. the holiday. Um, things like spiders, owls is another one that you see. Mm. Um, I, that has to do bats has to do with the fact that we tend to celebrate the nocturnal predators with a mm. um, holiday that's a little bit scary and that is uh, partly in celebration of the lengthening night. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And we talked about the devil a little bit as well. Uh, and when did you when do you feel like the devil sort of became associated with with Halloween? I think he's kind of late. I think he's almost twentieth century, really. Um, well, no, we do get we get a few mentions of the people performing the pranks and the the fortune telling tricks and so forth in the name of the devil. So, eighteenth century, maybe. Hmm. Mm. And he changes because he you said originally he was he wore black. He wore, if you look at early costuming guides, you see them talking about black leotards for the devil. Um, but we do also have some early postcards where he's showing as being the red skinned guy. So it seems mm -hmm. like maybe the red skinned treatment of him really comes into play early 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we talked about how there was constant transformations of Halloween and how it's becoming a global phenomenon. Can you talk about that, about how it's changing and going across the globe and what are different people doing in different places? It It's interesting. I think people might be surprised to know why Halloween has spread around the globe so much just in the last 15 years. And there are two things responsible for it that I don't think people would expect. One is American sitcoms. <laughs> um, sitcoms like Roseanne and The Simpsons did Halloween episodes. They loved Halloween. Those things have been syndicated all over the world. And so you have somebody who's sitting like in South Africa and watching a, a cute Halloween episode of Roseanne or one of The Simpsons' Tree Houses of Horror, and they're going, that looks fun. Um, yeah. So it starts to catch on from that. And then the other thing is uh, American fast foods. You get outfits like McDonald's going in with their Halloween Happy Meals. And again, people start going, oh, look at these cute pails with these pumpkin faces. That's And, you know, my kid looks so cute with that. And um, I mean, who doesn't love seeing their kid dressed up in an adorable outfit holding a big mm -hmm. bright orange pumpkin thing? Um 
So it really catches on around the world, thanks to those two elements. And again, this is very recent. This is like the last 15 mm -hmm. years when I did mm -hmm. my encyclopedia, there was almost nothing. There were a few isolated celebrations in certain English speaking parts of the globe, not like what I found just 10 years ago. It's, it's amazing how popular it has become in places you would never have expected it. Um, in terms of what I think might be going on with the future of Halloween, one of the things that I predicted 15 years ago was that we would see Halloween and Dia de los Muertos meld more in especially mm. the sort of border areas of the U.S. And I think we have seen that. Um, mm -hmm. it's interesting to me, I, I, every year I love to go to the Halloween stores and see what they're selling this year. Bones are huge skeletons, mm -hmm. skulls, bones. And I think that's probably a little bit of a holdover from Dia de los Muertos, which mm -hmm. is everyone knows about candy skulls and, um, mm -hmm. the sort of calaveras that we see with Dia de los Muertos. And, um, I, beyond that, we are, I think, going to see it take on more regional flavors in different parts of the world. I think, for example, in Hong Kong, where it's been big for a while, there is um, a very popular amusement park in Hong Kong, Hong Kong called, I think it's Ocean Amusement Park, something like that. And they've been doing um, uh, Halloween mazes for a long time. And a mm. few years ago, for the first time, I saw one that was themed all around Buddhist uh, mythology. Um, it was a Halloween maze that took you through the Buddhist hells. And I thought that was amazing. And I suspect we're going to see more of that kind of meshing mm. of with local beliefs and traditions. Taking their own mythology and, and adding into our Halloween. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I, I, I can't wait to see what people come up with because I mean, I, I love Halloween in part because you can be so, so creative with it. There's so many different directions you can go with Halloween and you can be scary or you can be, you know, bright and cheerful. You can dress like Tinkerbell and that's just fine. Or you can go as scary as you want. And I, I, I love that element that there's such a large spectrum of what you can do with Halloween. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, that is one of the reasons that certain people in Russia have specifically um, cited that the reason they love Halloween is that they love to be so creative and do spectacular makeups and costumes and things. It's mm -hmm. frowned on there, by the way. The um, Russian Orthodox Church doesn't like it. The The political doesn't like it, but um, people love it anyways and try to celebrate <laughs> They're doing it. it anyways. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there was something I was meaning to ask you about candy corn. Candy corn has an interesting history, doesn't it? It does. It was invented by uh, one specific manufacturer, and the name escapes me. It is essentially just wax and uh, corn syrup. But um, he had the idea of combining the three colors, the, the yellow, the orange, the white. Again, this is fairly recent. This is about 100 years old. So if you ever hear that candy corn has some ancient... Um, <laughs> derivative, it doesn't. Well, you know, I was surprised that it was even that old. Yeah. I just assumed that it was like from like 20 years ago. I had, I, to me, when I, I read that it was only, a, that it was a hundred years, I was really surprised that it had been around for that long and that it's, you know, I, I don't particularly like candy corn, although I'll get it and, you know, decorate my cakes and things with it because it, it does add, you know, a lovely color. But um, I, I, I was very surprised at its age. So I thought 100 years sounded old. Yeah, yeah. It's been around for a while. I, I also love seeing the variants on it now. Um, you know, the they started with the, oh, no, now it's got a little bit of brown and chocolate in it. And then now there are just mm -hmm. all kinds of crazy variations of it. And it, where did the colors black and orange come? When did that come into play? That's a really good question. And that's another thing that I think might surprise people. That's fairly recent. Um, I can look at a Halloween party guide from like 1910. And they will say in the party guide, the traditional colors of Halloween are brown and yellow. And the brown and yellow were derived from the harvest things, the corn mm -hmm. and the 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 corn husk, which turned brown, of course. Um, not long after that, though, is when we get 
that pumpkin image is mm-hmm. just emblazoned on everything, on all the postcards, on the decorations that are now being marketed and, and sold. And, um, and then you get the black coming in just, I think, the night association, the mm-hmm. association maybe with death, that kind of thing. So um, within mm-hmm. that space of like 10 years, by 1920, it's pretty firm that it's black and orange. Mm-hmm. So what have we missed about Halloween that is important that we we might need to talk about? Well, the only thing I would mention is over how it has changed again over the last 50 years. Um, mm, it okay. has gone from being something that was almost exclusively for kids to much more of an adult celebration. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we can actually pinpoint one thing that that really sets that in motion and it it's the 1978 release of john carpenter's halloween which suddenly takes this beloved children's holiday and turns it into a thing of absolute terror for adults Mm -hmm. and after that it we start to see things like the haunted attractions industry coming into play. And um, that begins in the eighties really with amusement parks who are having a slow fall season after the busy summer. And they are looking for ways to turn a profit in the fall. And they start to come up with this idea of, oh, look, there were some nonprofit groups like the JCs and Campus Life putting on these simple little haunted attractions. And they did well with those. Maybe we can do this on a big scale. So here in California is where it made the most sense to invent that because we don't have to worry about terrible weather in the fall. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. So we started to get Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm and Universal creating this massive industry, which of course is now huge. Um, I have seen figures as high as a billion a year on the haunted attractions Mm. industry, which seems a little high to me, truthfully. But on the other hand, there are thousands of professional and nonprofit, both um, haunted attractions staged every year. Um, Many of them open as early as August, usually more like September. Um, Mm -hmm. And there are more and more of them that are opening either for other celebrations as well. There are, um, for example, they'll put on a scary Valentine's Day maze, something like that. And (laughs) there again, if I was to predict for the future, I would say we may see more of those kind of places go year round. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, there used to, were there haunted houses for the the children that were less scary before the the haunted houses really came out in the seventies. There were, and and we can trace that back to um, some of those early celebrations that came out of the depression when they were trying to buy off these pranksters. They would create these mm. things called trails of terror. And the trails of terror were often outdoors, and it might be the kind of thing where they would lead the kids through a wooded park and have people place behind the trees to jump out of them or they might dress up their basement and i have some hilarious party guides about suggestions for dressing up the basement that would be guaranteed to land you in court these days because they're <laughs> things like hey grease up the stairs and put a mattress at the bottom yeah i mean they're crazy um but that is kind of the beginning of the haunted house attraction and uh-huh. um, then in the 60s and 70s is when we see these nonprofit groups like the JCs coming in and, and they realize that putting these on in October is a huge money maker for them. And mm. they um, create guidebooks and all of their chapters are doing these things now. And it kind of, again, leads the way to the big scale um, haunted attractions and um, which, of course, are almost the main way Halloween is celebrated now. Um, I know trick or treat has become much more regionalized. I get interesting emails from people all over the country every year saying, Oh, this year in my town, there's only like one, two block area where all the kids go for trick or treat. Um, Mm -hmm. I certainly have seen that here in LA. We have a couple of sort of more affluent neighborhoods that go nuts for Halloween and people will, Mm -hmm. will bring their kids into those areas from all over the city. And um, so that's kind of a weird thing that we're seeing with trick or treat. It seems like it's not that it's less popular, but that it has become very like closed off. Mm -hmm. It feels concentrated. Yeah. I feel like, 
you know, in our neighborhood, for instance, I live on a street with there's not a lot of children. And so before I had kids, we sat out and tried to pass out candy, but no one came by. I think we had five people, five trick-or-treat groups came by, which is nothing. But like three, three streets over is like a madhouse carnival because everyone, the entire street, decorates their houses and that is where everybody from our neighborhood goes like you might go a little bit in the neighborhood to that to that street but it's very very concentrated on those two streets where they really do up their houses to the nines yeah yeah so it, it it definitely and and that makes sense i mean it's really you know more fun for the children um to be like com- completely like surrounded by all these different costumes and this kind of you know people just drive in from from there whereas like it is fun as well to do your streets and you know talk with your neighbors and I, I love that community element to it but I, I do see that concentration around um, neighborhoods as well where there's just specific areas that really do it up yeah yeah um okay anything else that we that we missed that we uh that it's important to Halloween. Hmm. I think we got most of it. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's going on for you now? What are what are you working on? Um, I have a book that has just come out. Um, it is my first coffee table art book. So it was really an interesting thing to put together. It's called The Art of the Zombie Movie. Um, released by Applause Books, and um, it has over 500 illustrations. And yes, I had to source all of those. But um, and writing the text was interesting. I learned a lot about the history behind zombies and the movies and so forth. Um, and then beyond that, I will be um, teaching a, or possibly by the time this goes out, have taught a course through Atlas Obscura on the history of Halloween. And um, I'm a big fan of Atlas Obscura, so I'm really thrilled about doing that. Well, are, are there any links that we can put up on our website we'll, that can direct people to? And, and obviously, we'll we'll put a link up for your book. Um, but what about the course that you're teaching? Is it specifically to, at a, a university no, it's or is it? it's virtual, and I will certainly provide you with a link to that. Awesome. And for our listeners, it's www.fabricoffolklore.com. That's where we'll put our links, just our w, our, our name of the web, of the podcast, www.fabricoffolklore.com. We'll put up all the links to her books and um, her website where you can see all the things that she's worked on, including your, you've done some nonfiction books uh, or fiction books, rather novels as well. Are they Halloween based as well? Some of them are. Yeah. I've actually got one book called the Shamanock and other Halloween treats, which is a collection of Halloween fiction. How fun. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This was, this was so much fun. Thank you, Vanessa. It was fun. And thank you, folksy folks, for joining us on our creepy journey through Halloween past and present. Uh, Like I said, all of the links that we mentioned will be up on the website. What unique Halloween traditions do you do in your family? And did you know the history of Halloween before you listened today? We want to hear from you, and and we encourage you to to, uh, come onto our Facebook page community group and continue that conversation and talk about the things that you hear about and think about after listening or watching on YouTube uh, to our podcast. And as always, if you rate and review our our show, I will call you out and say thank you so much because we definitely appreciate it when you give us stars and, and give us reviews that are helpful for other new people to find our podcast. We're on social medias, Facebook, Instagram, X, or Twitter. Um, Please share and like and follow on on those. And you've been listening to Fabric of Folklore. Once again, I'm Vanessa Y. Rogers. And until next time, keep the folk alive. All right.